Tonight, I invite you to a new train journey after the ones we made on the Orient Express and the Trans-Siberian. This time we will discover the history of American railroads, especially in the 19th century. We will see how they spread from the industrial east to the plantations of the south to the Great Plains and the Pacific coast. I will tell you about the development of railroads and also how they transformed America geographically, economically, socially. We will follow economic booms and bursts, how huge fortunes were made, the role railroads played in the civil war, how they transformed the country, the way people lived, moved, and consumed. There is a lot to tell, but all you have to do is let me explain things. You may close your eyes at any time and just follow the story without visuals. The train sounds from the beginning have now disappeared. But they will be back after I am done talking to lull you to sleep. If you are a member of my Patreon, you can access a second version of this story with background train sounds all along. It will be posted as a podcast on Patreon. There is a link to this page in the description of the video and in the pinned comment on top of the comment section. And as always, if this is more convenient for you, the story will also soon be available on Spotify, Apple Music and other streaming services with dozens more. The link is in the description as well. But for now, take a deep breath, adopt a comfortable position, and off we go. Let's begin our story in 1830 in Baltimore, where and when the first railroad in the United States was inaugurated, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. The United States of 1830 were obviously very different what they would become along the rest of the century. At the time, the country had just 13 million inhabitants, a number that had been growing very fast since independence, but the country was still essentially rural and agrarian. Out of these 13 million souls, 2 million lived in the state of New York, the most populated, followed by Pennsylvania and Virginia. New York City had just reached 200,000 inhabitants and it was by far the largest city in the country, followed by Baltimore and Philadelphia with around 80,000. Two million out of 13 million were slaves, mainly in southern states and the country actually occupied only a third of its current size, the most eastern third. All the rest was claimed territory, claimed by the US, by Mexico or Great Britain. At the time there were no large factories and the economy was still based on agriculture mainly. For local production, and also cash crops for export, especially in the south, that were booming to satisfy European and local demand, cotton, tobacco, dyes. The Industrial Revolution was speeding up in Great Britain and taking off in Western Europe. America was culturally and 
economically very connected to Europe, of course. And with the constant flow of migrants, rich and poor, this ensured that labor, know-how, techniques and capital were available. So were raw materials, in abundance, all the ingredients for the country to begin an industrial revolution of its own. And this was burgeoning in 1830, impulsed by local investors and uh, entrepreneurs who uh, had accumulated capital from trade, banking or plantations. There was already a sense among the elite and also the majority of migrants that this was an extraordinary land of opportunities and indeed it wouldn't disappoint in the following decades at least for those who managed to seize or create these opportunities. Another certainty that dominated at the time was the need for the country to build itself up, to organize this gigantic and growing space that was still scarcely populated and nothing should stand in the way of this project, not the geography that would be transformed with ways of communication like new roads and canals. For example, the national road that connected the Potomac and the Ohio rivers had been started in 1811 and in 1830 works were going on on it. Nature would not stop expansion and nor would people. 1830 was the year when the Indian Removal Act was signed into law, authorizing the expulsion of all Native American tribes from the east to the west of the Mississippi, so that their lands could be occupied by settlers, and it was strongly enforced. This is the context in which railroads were built for the first time, and train services put into place, investors willing to develop new businesses, a government encouraging the development of its national territory, and the need to carry around raw materials, manufactured goods, and passengers too. The very first train services followed and copied British railroad technology. I told you about it in the video about the Orient Express, the link is in the description, because at the time this was the pioneer industry. But manufacturing of local equipment, especially locomotives, followed quickly in the 1830s. The first fully American locomotive was produced by the end of 1830 in the state of New York for another new railroad company from South Carolina and it was called the Best Friend of Charleston. It was used along a six-mile demonstration route on which it impressed people because it could reach a speed of 15 to 25 miles per hour that is 25 to 40 kilometers per hour. That was high speed in 1830. The only mode of travel that could go faster than that was a very experienced horse and rider, but not much faster. At the time in all countries where railroads appeared, they were an attractive but also a frightening novelty. In the UK and France, for example, there were calls to caution, including by some physicians, because the effects of such speeds on human bodies were unknown. What if traveling at 20 or 30 miles per hour for several minutes could kill people or make them sick? And what if they fell from the trains? For safety, the first passenger cars in France were locked so that the passengers could not open the doors from the inside. 
which in fact was very dangerous because in case of a fire or an accident, they would not be able to evacuate. But there was also curiosity, and in the 1830s, when trains were still very new, it was common for people to try them as an attraction rather than a means of transport. This first American locomotive, the best friend of Charleston, was also the first to suffer a boiler explosion in America. It was steam-powered, of course, like all locomotives from the 19th century. So the energy came from a boiler, where heat turned water into steam. But the internal pressure had to remain within certain limits, like all boilers, so that it could be uh, contained. There was a valve for pressure release, and it whistled. This is where the whistle sound of steam locomotives comes from. It seems in the case of this accident, the fireman had grown tired of listening to it whistle. So to stop the noise, he closed the valve. Not a good idea, of course. The pressure within the boiler exceeded its capacity and it exploded. This accident eroded confidence in the public. So to restore it, in the 1830s, it was common in the first trains to place a flat car piled with cotton bales between the locomotive and the other passenger cars so that the passengers were shielded in case something happened to the locomotive. Along the 1830s and 40s, more lines were built and operated, especially in the northeast, around industrial centers, and in the south, but with different logics. The network in the north was designed primarily to bring raw materials like coal and iron to factories, connect them with ports, and also there was a larger market for passengers because they were more densely populated. Cities were absolutely booming at the time. I told you that New York City had 200,000 inhabitants in 1830. In 1850, this number had increased, it had tripled to 600,000. And in 1900, there would be more than 3 million. But some cases were even more impressive. Chicago in 1840 was just a big village with 4,000 souls. In 30 years, it became a respectable city of 300,000 by 1870, and in 1900, it had 1.7 million inhabitants. American cities in the Northeast had a very impressive growth rates in the 19th century, because they received a large part of European migrants from Germany, Italy, Scandinavia, Ireland, and also former black slaves who moved north after the Civil War, where industry was hiring new workers by millions and needed uh, ever more arms. Between these large cities, the need for transport was constantly growing. In the southeast of the country, Industrialization was much less systematic, population was less dense, and the economy remained much more agrarian. The main exports were cash crops, and so railroads were used primarily to transport them to the coast or to the closest waterway which is also typical of the railroads that Europeans funded and built in their colonies. They were made to carry raw materials to ports from where they could be shipped to factories on another continent. In 
So they didn't create a network to connect different points of the local market. We'll talk about it later, but this was a major problem for southern states during the Civil War. The North had a very developed and integrated railroad network that could be used to transport troops and equipment across its territory, whereas the South could often not rely on its railroads that were less dense and not designed to unify its territory. Even before and after the Civil War, it was impossible to send cotton to cotton mills in the north entirely by train. Cotton was sent to a port on the Atlantic coast or the Gulf of Mexico and then shipped by boat to New York, Boston, Philadelphia or Baltimore to be processed. By the 1850s, there were now 9,000 miles of railroad lines in the United States. That's about 14,000 kilometers. It was more than England or France, but on a much larger territory. So the density of the network was not that high yet. And the government wished to accelerate the move, the development of railroads. With technical progress that improved speeds, railroads were increasingly replacing horse or stagecoach in the northeast, and also for travels from the east coast to the middle west. But beyond the Mississippi Basin, everything remained to be built, and the great migration to the west of the years 1830, 40, 50, was made essentially with horses and wagons. I told you about this in the story about the Donner Party. I will also put the link in the description. To uh, stimulate development to the West, an approach favored by the government was land grants. The government gifted land or its use privileges to make people settle and develop it. So new railroad companies were given millions of acres in the West in the years 1850s and 60s. This industry picked up speed and this provided the basis for faster expansion, a railroad mania and a number of transformations in American society that went well beyond railroads themselves. A number of inland cities had been turned into sorts of inland ports thanks to their connection by train. People could transit through them before going further west. It made sense to build factories or warehouses because they could receive materials and send manufactured goods away. This is how inland cities like Chicago experienced tremendous growth. Railroads could be operated all year round, contrary to boats on many rivers and canals. They were also more flexible because they could reach almost any destination. So after having replaced stagecoaches and wagons on main lines, they competed with and progressively eliminated steamboats in the second half of the 19th century. As railroads kept expanding, the Civil War burst in 1861 and raged for four years until 1865. The central cause of the war, as you know, was the status of slavery. Not just its existence in southern states, that defended it, but in new states that were being formed in the West. And there were also other sources of divergence between southern and northern states. The level of independence of states within the Union, the very different economies, 
The North was more protectionist. Manufacturing interests in states that had industrialized approved protectionism, whereas the South was in favor of free trade because its elite lived from a large part on exports. There were also cultural and political differences. In the North, patriotic support for the Union was quite strong, whereas the South was more split between those loyal to the entire United States and those loyal to the Southern region. The South was also often portrayed in terms that were less than flattering in the North, as a backwards, ignorant region, which only reinforced the sense of cultural and political separation from the North in southern states. Finally, when Abraham Lincoln was elected president in 1860, this was the final trigger for secession. Southern states feared that he would completely stop the expansion of slavery in new states, and put it on a course toward extinction. Given the demographics and political situation, the South faced the future as a perpetual minority within the Union. And so, even before Lincoln took office in 1861, seven states had declared their secession and joined to form the Confederacy. They were joined by four more, totaling 11 states out of 34. Based on population, economy, and industrial capacity, the war was very unbalanced in favor of the North, and railroads were one of the reasons. As I said before, the North had at its disposal a dense and better designed network to transport troops and move equipment around. In contrast, in the south, lines connected cotton regions with waterways or the coast. They had less military value, and almost all the railroad industry was in the north, so between the lack of spare parts and the destruction of the war, which was thought essentially in the south, railroads collapsed in the south and couldn't support the war effort. After the war, when reconstruction began, the southern network was expanded dramatically, but mainly by northern companies and interests. But even before the civil war was over, the government of the Union was planning for railroads to be expanded westward so that the Atlantic and Pacific coasts would finally be connected. This was a decades-long dream. There had been a movement of population to the west since the 1830s, but reaching California or Oregon from the eastern United States was very complicated. There were two possible routes, one by the sea, but it was ridiculously long. The Panama Canal did not exist yet, so ships had to travel all the way to the south of South America, pass through Cape Horn to the south of Argentina and Chile, enter the Pacific, and then go north all the way up to North America. It was expensive. It took weeks even on steamboats. And there were multiple stops along the way. That was very impractical. The alternative was by land. But at the time there were only very basic roads or tracks. But this is the way hundreds of thousands of migrants traveled through the Middle West and the Rocky Mountains with wagons carrying all their possessions and families. The appeal of a transcontinental line, or several, was obvious, but this meant thousands of miles of tracks and a huge investment 
This was one of the projects that changed the scale of the railroads industry. It required large public companies funded on the financial market by stock and bondholders. In the years 1860s and 70s, the need for workers to build and operate railroads was considerable. This was the time when tens of thousands of Chinese and Irish workers were hired to work on the tracks, and railroads became the biggest employers in America, second only to agriculture. In 1869, the first transcontinental railroad was opened. It connected the existing eastern network with the Pacific coast. The starting point of the new line was in Iowa, and it reached San Francisco. The time to travel from one coast to the other dropped to only six days which was crucial to integrate the American territory in a single economy, a single market, and also control it. Other transcontinental lines followed shortly after, one to the south, through Texas and New Mexico, to South California, and one to the north, following the frontier with Canada. Now, the development of railroads had uh, many other consequences than just lines of tracks. Consequences that are maybe less visible, but deeper and uh, really interesting to look at. It is hard to overstate how railroads transformed the United States. They had repercussions on many levels on American society and economy. So let's take a look at all these aspects before we return to the chronology. First, the multiplication of railroads created a single market, which is very important for a modern country to hold together. Prior to the development of railroads, National economies were very fragmented. Of course, there was trade and transportation of goods on trade routes, like waterways, and roads on shorter distances. But this was slow and expensive. So in practice, for most goods, the economy was very local. Not just in America, it was the case all over the world. But this was even truer in the United States because of the size of the country. Until the opening of train lines, California or Texas were barely connected economically to the Northeast. There was a movement of people, political entity, but very few economic activity between states that were far apart. This completely changed when New York City and San Francisco became connected in less than a week. A factory from New York or Pennsylvania could now send goods to the other side of the country in a matter of days. So this boosted growth for industrial businesses by opening them a much larger market. With railroads came much larger factories with thousands of workers, a concentration that had never been seen before to make economies of scale and uh, satisfy this uh, much bigger demand. This didn't go without new problems. American capitalism in the 19th century saw spectacular fortunes emerge in various industries based on huge companies that established monopolies or oligopolies. In metallurgy, in mining, later oil, or even railroads themselves, a few men established huge fortunes in these new industries in a way that is not so dissimilar to technology in the past 30 years. This was a completely new phenomenon back then, and because there was a lack of regulation or efficient control over 
business practices. They could sometimes have very brutal methods to take control of a market. They removed their competition with dumping or sometimes even physically by blocking their activity. Antitrust and consumer laws, the regulation of businesses, were a consequence of these new practices. But still, spectacular fortunes were built, and when it comes to railroads, they include names like Cornelius Vanderbilt, or Jay Gould, or the banker J.P. Morgan. Vanderbilt made his wealth initially in shipping. He was born in 1794, so when railroads appeared in America, he was already a mature and experienced businessman. He understood early that railroads were the future of transportation and would replace probably boats on waterways. So he invested heavily in them and ended up owning the New York Central Railroad, which was located in the northeast. It connected New York City and Boston in the east with Chicago and St. Louis in the Midwest. He not only invested, he also organized. He embraced new forms of organization and management to deal with the increasing complexity of railroad networks and the economy in general. He was also one of the early users of the financial market and public companies to uh, gather capital and use it to compete and he had a reputation for having uh, brutal business methods. Like other businessmen that also were successful at the time, he had a reputation for being uh, unscrupulous. By the end of the century, men like him were called robber barons for their exploitative practices, controlling natural resources, influencing government, by relations or even corruption, paying minimal wages, squashing competition by ruining and acquiring competitors. There is some truth to it. I mean, factually, robber barons did all this to maximize profit and grow even more. But they were probably driven more by the thirst for power and the urge to build companies than pure greed. They obviously liked wealth, but they often gave back a substantial part of it to charities, universities, churches, libraries, public buildings like museums. There was probably a part of calculation and public relations in this practice, but still, the fact that these robber barons worked until their last day seems to prove that their main drive was not just to amass wealth and enjoy it. Vanderbilt's fortune of the 1870s, adjusted for inflation, would amount to more than $200 billion of today. That is to say, something to the tune of Jess Bezos' fortune. One of his rivals, Hill Railroads, also based in New York, and uh, not more popular, was Jay Gould. Gould started investing in railroads buying stocks, and uh, he took huge risks at the beginning, risks that paid off. In 1857, he took control of a company, the Rutland and Washington Railroad, in a panic that gave him the opportunity to buy stocks for 10 cents on the dollar. He kept investing in the stock market, but he knew how to better his odds by manipulating prices and using insider information. These practices are obviously totally illegal, but at the time they were harder to prove and actually quite common. He speculated on other industries and commodities 
example, he was involved in an attempt to uh, corner the gold market, that is to say to buy enough to uh, make the price artificially rise, and then sell with a profit when the movement acquires a dynamic of its own because of panic buying by others. This time, this backfired, and the price of gold collapsed suddenly in 1869. But Gould and his co-conspirator, another magnate called James Fisk, managed to escape prosecution thanks to their political connections. But this went public, and Gould was one of the most hated of these robber parents. Maybe I'll make another story one day about robber barons, because they all have a little story that is morally questionable, but they were also empire builders, and they represent an aspect of the times. There are many more in other industries, like Andrew Carnegie and uh, Henry Frick for steel, John Jacob Astor, with fur and real estate, Hearst in media, Rockefeller with oil, JP Morgan in banking. But let's return to the impact of railroads on American economy and society. Another consequence was that it stimulated the emergence of a private financial system. As I said earlier, the need for capital to fund the construction of railroads was bigger than ever seen before. To give you an idea, one mile of track costed the same as a new steamboat. So the construction of the first transcontinental line, which was 3,000 miles long, was equivalent to the cost of 3,000 boats. No single investor could pay for that and banks were not large enough to lend that kind of money. It became necessary to organize a financial market of bonds and stocks, where investors, large and small, would contribute with their capital. Until the First World War, railroads were the basis and the largest industry on the American financial market. But railroads also changed the lives of ordinary Americans as workers and as consumers. Workers because railroads revolutionized management. Before them, managerial techniques were much more simple. Factories were smaller and a company typically had only one. But when they started to produce in multiple locations, with factories that supplied each other, the need for rational organization and optimization appeared. Engineers became necessary to manage industrial and even services businesses. Railroad companies also grew much more complex with size. They became big employers of professional managers that organized the ever-growing traffic on their larger and larger system. One thing that made the organization even more complex is that most lines had a single track and trains ran in both directions. So when lines had dozens of stations and hundreds of clients for freight and passengers, can imagine the scheduling and organization that this required. Work became much more time sensitive and probably more stressful than it used to be for all people involved. It changed the way people worked and the distribution of responsibilities within businesses. Consumers were also very much impacted the variety of goods available increased dramatically, costs dropped, and the first steps of mass consumption began, still very modestly in comparison with what it became in the 20th century. 
that even the working class could now go to uh, stores and uh, occasionally buy manufactured goods. The development of railroads and department stores was contemporary. For a part, the logistic of large stores in cities depended on trains, on freight, and trains made it possible to operate such large stores. But even though America was urbanizing and uh, large cities were booming, the majority of the population still lived in uh, small towns and villages. The proximity of a train station connected them with uh, the big city, where most people could now go at least once in their lives. This opened new horizons and actually accelerated the growth of cities, because they were attractive places to live. With department stores, another form of retail appeared to mail order, and it also relied heavily on railroads. A success story in this category was Sears and Roebuck, which later opened stores, but it began as a uh, mail order retailer. They sent big catalogues by mail to consumers in every state, in cities but also small town America, which was the market they targeted. Clients could take away their products at the nearest train station when they decided to buy. I'll add a link in the description to readings of sections of the Sears catalogue of 1897 by a channel and a podcast also called Boring Books for Bedtime, if you want to give it a try. I find it very interesting because it shows not only the description and price of a huge range of goods, there is also the way they present their business to customers. They explain why their prices are supposedly much lower than their competitors. They try to create a complicity in the relationship with clients, using a mix of rational and emotional language. This is modern consumer marketing being invented and deployed across all types of consumers. And in the Sears catalog, they did it on all sorts of products all sorts of goods, from books or musical instruments to uh, agricultural equipment. Many of their customers were farmers. Yet another consequence, and this one was favorable for workers, was the uh, career path offered by railroads. They tended to pay better than other industries, and to retain their employees, they offered benefits, including some of the first pension schemes. For blue-collar workers, railroads hired men around 20, and as long as they stayed with the same employer, they had perspectives to evolve. First they would work on the tracks, then become firemen, team supervisors, and some of them could work their way up to the engineer, changing status and standards of living. Mechanics also had a career path. They could begin as shop workers and be formed by the company to become skilled mechanics and later freight and passenger conductors. So there were tangible advantages coming with trains, and railroads were very widely embraced by Americans, even without taking a train or waiting for a passenger. People in towns in the years 1830s and 40s would dress up on Sundays to go to the station and see the trains arrive. The vision of a massive locomotive traveling on hundreds of miles at high speed, only thanks to engineering and industrial processes. This was a breathtaking vision for the time.
The same phenomenon appeared later with planes. In the first decades of aviation, people went to airports just to watch the planes take off and land because it was marvelous and spectacular. And the stations were given an architecture that went well beyond mere functionality. Like in Europe, they became monuments with an impressive architecture and uh, ornamentation that distinguished them from other buildings of the industrial era. All American cities that were already of a significant size by the end of the 19th century have at least one impressive train station. For smaller towns, it became vital to be connected to a train line. Without it, decline and sometimes the disappearance of the town was almost unavoidable. So, cities and states also participated in the funding or the land grants to railroads to ensure they were not left aside. In front of this enthusiasm, there were few opponents, at least at the beginning. Some lobbies were hostile to railroads, like transporters on waterways, for obvious reasons. And when railroad construction picked up speed in the 1830s and 40s, a few authors and poets lamented the damages they would do to landscapes. But this never weighed much. The more significant opposition arose from the 1870s, when railroads had gained considerable power, and it came from farmers in particular, because thanks to their monopolies in some regions, railroads could impose higher prices for transport. Laws were passed to fix maximum prices to stop abuse from them. But still, after the first two generations, once railroad had become a fact of life, their image became much more mixed. They were also symbols of monopolies, unhinged capitalism. They had a power of life or death on towns. Their owners had built fortunes, and there were several scandals related to their activity of collusion with politicians or market manipulation. So they also became vilified sometimes. And here again, the parallel with tech, media and online services in our age could make sense to some extent. Now the intense development of railroads didn't go without booms and bursts. It was never linear. The 1860s were a very favorable decade, despite the civil war. But in 1873, there was a financial crash that had severe economic repercussions almost until the end of the century, and a period of slow growth began before it reaccelerated at the turn of the century. In the years 1880s and 90s, most main lines had already been built, and investment slowed down. It was now time to reorganize and unify the American network, which was operated by dozens of companies. It was necessary to harmonize prices and facilitate long-distance travels. A lot of this restructuring was organized by J.P. Morgan, banker I talked about before. But the end of the Gilded Age was coming. The network peaked in length of trackage by 1916, with more than 250,000 miles of tracks. That is to say the equivalent to 10 times the circumference of the Earth. But in 1916, Railroads were already under attack, and the future would be quite different for them. 
the magic of the first ticket when people would gather to see trains pass by and when there was a sense of progress and wonderful opportunities associated with the railroads, his enthusiasm was gone. Railroads had probably concentrated too much and uh, shared regions between them, giving them too much pricing power. So by the beginning of the 20th century, some were dissolved, broken into separate companies as a part of an antitrust policy, especially under President Theodore Roosevelt in the 1900s. Laws were passed to set maximum rates and review the company's financial records to ensure that their profitability was not too high. So, politically and socially, the positive image of railroads had evaporated, even though they were still vital as an industry. But the worst for them was yet to come. During the First World War, which the US entered in 1917, it appeared that the network, with all its private separate operators, was unable to adequately support the war effort, which was essentially about equipping and sending troops to Europe. So in 1917, the management was nationalized, not the companies and the ownership of the tracks and rolling stock, but the US government took over management of railroads. And this lasted until 1920. This temporary nationalization had showed a weakness in the American railroad system. Private initiative supported by the state had been very good at creating a large network the largest in the world, and uh, at lifting the entire economy with it. But the multiplicity of operators and companies also meant that facilities were duplicated, prices were all over the place, and due to their specificities, it is hard to choose between a private and public management of railroads. The private sector had done wonders at creating and developing what was now the biggest American industry. But if it was left alone, it tended to create regional monopolies that penalized the consumer. Regulation didn't work that well, neither. Because when these monopolies were broken, the system tended to become inefficient. The option chosen in the 1920s was to let railroads operate as businesses but with a tighter and tighter control over their prices and a, a forced consolidation that would create larger regional systems. Before this was implemented anyway, railroads were already starting to decline. After World War I, the automobile era had truly begun, and the wonders of the day were no longer locomotives, but individual cars and uh, trucks that could compete with trains and were much more flexible to transport people or freight from one point to another. And then came 1929 and the depression of the 1930s. Like all other sectors, Railroads nosedived. Many small railroads failed and were not rescued by the government. The policy in the first years of the recession was to let businesses die, which was understandable but also fed the depression. The survivors were unable or uninterested in supporting the weaker ones, and the downturn of the whole industry the financial losses meant that the excess profitability of railroad companies was no longer an urgent problem. The new issue was more to keep them alive to avoid further damage to the economy. Even though the depression was overcome, American railroads never recovered. 
time of their splendor had really gone. After World War II, in the 1940s and 50s, the automobile boom accelerated even more. The government and the country were still interested in infrastructure, but railroads had been the priority of the previous century. Highways and better paved roads were now the new priority. And on top of that, airlines were now competing for passenger traffic on long distance. Along the 1950s and 60s, most railroads abandoned passenger train service, except in very dense areas for short distance trips, like along the East Coast. For many Americans, the practice of using trains is something that disappeared in this period, which is a big difference with countries like Japan, the UK, Germany or France, where trains are still a part of life for national journeys because the distances are shorter and generally the governments have taken over and nationalized, if not the entire operation, at least the infrastructure with the tracks and the stations. So for American railroads, income sources were shrinking the need to invest had uh, never disappeared, tracks had to be maintained, and rolling stock had to be modernized. After the age of steam, diesel and electricity replaced it to power locomotives. Passenger cars had to be replaced too, and it appeared in the 1960s that the industry was no longer viable in its current form. So it was nationalized. A company owned by the government, Amtrak, was created for passenger traffic. It still operates long distance lines, but its market share is now very small against airlines and uh, it is uncommon for Americans to use trains for such travels. The only uh, region of America where there is uh, a quite intense railroad traffic is on the East Coast, as many people still use them daily to go to work and back to where they live. Freight activities were more viable because they remain competitive on long distance. Transcontinental lines still work to carry heavy loads from coast to coast and across the Midwest. Freight is operated today by various railroads that have been deregulated again since the 1980s. And there has been a little revival of freight due to the rise in fuel costs that made road transport more expensive and the construction of new terminals near ports where containers can be directly loaded and taken away. Obviously, American railroads are now the shadow of what they used to be when uh, it comes to their importance in daily life. And taking into account all the social and economic changes that they once brought. But they are not dead. And there are projects being studied or already under construction for high-speed train systems for passengers. One is functioning in Florida, and there is a big project in California that should connect Los Angeles to San Francisco in under three hours, but it should not open before 2033. We have reached the end of our journey for tonight. I hope you liked it, and I'll speak to you soon with another story. This time I will take you to Mars, but for now, I uh, let you relax and fall asleep if you wish to, to the sweet sounds of the train. Sleep well, sweet dreams. <laughs>